Okay, so I've got to follow that. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, as Fiona said, my name is Jacqueline Mayer. I'm based at Edinburgh and University of Scotland. And I'll be talking to you about some of the work I've been doing with technology. Um, and first of all, I have a question. And that is, who remembers the release of the first mobile phone? And that's you showing your age. <laughs> I wasn't born then. Uh, <laughs> I do remember this beauty though, the Nokia 3310, and I think most of us in this room probably remember life before smartphones, um, but scarily, there's a lot of our younger generation that do not know life before smartphones. The smartphone was released in 2007, the Apple iPhone, also the Fitbit the first wearable tracker was released in 2008, and since then, technology has just grown at a rapid, rapid pace. Um, and that's a challenge for us as a scientist to explore how we can use that technology. Wearable technology is the number one fitness trend, ACSM fitness trend in 2019. We're at a stage now where adults have almost unlimited access to internet. 97% of EU adults have internet, 85% use a smartphone. So there's no, it's not surprising then that smartphone apps and wearables are being used to try to help change health behaviours. And we're at a point now where people are tracking so much of themselves. But can we use technology to increase physical activity, to reduce sedentary behaviour and effectively improve health? I want to talk to you about three projects that I've been involved with um, over the past few years. And the first one is um, a collaboration that we did with Intel and Trill, the Technology Research and Independent Living Group at, at University College Dublin. Um, and at this time, this is 2010, but I was researching the health benefits of accumulating high intensity activity bouts throughout the day. So little short blasts of activity throughout the day. And we were interested to see if technology could facilitate um, an intervention on in delivering that kind of exercise. Um, and with this particular piece of software, we wanted to create uh, an opportunity for monitoring exercise prescription. Someone's already mentioned about adherence to exercise prescription. How do you know that someone is actually doing that? This piece of software tracked heart rate, step and cadence, um, and ratings of perceived exertion for every single exercise session. The second idea was that that information could be remotely monitored by a health practitioner. So that information could be sent to a GP, for example, who could then look at that information, the data. They could tweak their uh, prescription, adapt, progress, whatever that may be. Um, so we tested this um, in a short four-week pilot study and we found that a very small amount of exercise delivered using the system, 27 minutes a, day, uh, a week of exercise, improved cardiorespiratory fitness um, and functional abilities in middle-aged and older adults. A nice thing about this was that they could install the system in the home or in the workplace or wherever they wanted to engage in the programme. And that got me interested in technology, particularly in different settings. Um, and when I, I then moved to Ulster University... Systems in people's home. Sorry. <laughs> I then used to move to Ulster University and um, we looked at whether technology could also reduce sedentary behaviour in the workplace. And we did a, a review of literature and a meta-analysis and found that technology can reduce sedentary behaviour about 41 minutes per day. But can we do this in the workplace for office workers who are in um, situations where they're spending a lot of time sitting, up to 82% of their days sitting, um, but they're at work for a reason, that is to work. So it's difficult for them to break up that sitting and engage in physical activity. We were interested in using um, technology, but we didn't quite know which would be the best thing to use. So we asked people, we asked office workers, their managers and the board level companies um, what their views were on sitting in the workplace and also how they might reduce their sedentary behaviour. Their ideas, their strategies um, that they come up with were around education about the environment, the culture in the workplace and specifically the technology strategies were about reminders, prompts and self-monitoring. This is what people thought would help them reduce their sitting. So we took that information, we used a user um, centered design iterative process and we used behaviour change theory to design a, a, a smartphone application for activity. And this had five behaviour change techniques 
you'll see self monitoring there, which was come through in our focus groups with um, office workers, goal setting prompts, and we added in educational factoids. Factoids being the geekiest term you come up with, I think. Um, but this was just little snippets and ideas of how people could integrate movement into the workday. We did a feasibility trial, so we weren't really testing for the huge effects at this point, but we wanted to see did it have some sort of impact. And we did that in a cluster randomised control trial where we had a group that had the app, a group that had the app and a workstation, a sit stand workstation, um, and a control group. And you can see that there wasn't really much change for the group that had the app. But the, app, the group that had the app and the sit stand workstation were able to reduce their sedentary behaviour by about 10%. I'll not read through all of these, um, but these were some of the kind of more qualitative feedback that we got from the participants around the benefits and the barriers to the particular application that we developed. But the overall sort of conclusion from that was that people really wanted it to be accurate information, and it wasn't always accurate. And so if we could fix the inaccuracies, have more automation, um, and try to introduce some context-specific um, understanding, that intervention would probably work a lot better. Okay, then the last thing I'm going to talk to you about is screen time. And screen time has been a big topic in um, you know, the news and things around how much children spend on screens. And this kind of image here is something you probably see quite often. There's not really that much research on more of younger adults using screens. So last year, uh, Apple and their software update released a screen time, uh, a screen time monitoring app, um, which also allowed you to restrict your screen time. So a very simple study we wanted to see if we restricted screen time, how would it affect physical activity and stage behaviour, and in this case sleep as well. So we did a baseline, uh, baseline data collection. Young people are spending 28 hours a week on their smartphone. That's not TVs, computers, anything else, that's their smartphone. They're spending about a waking day, 15 hours, on social media alone. And they've got huge amounts of pickups and notifications and, and interaction with their smartphone throughout the day. The top five apps that people are using are social media apps. So we took these top five and we restricted them by 50%. The next week, um, students carried on with their everyday life, but we had this restriction in place. And we just measured their physical activity and their sedentary behaviour. I'm going to present some of the um, domain-specific data at the moment. We do have objective data, um, which I haven't got at the moment, but we're working on. But some of the kind of initial results here are that, obviously, mobile and tablet uh, sedentary behaviour has reduced. That was a significant reduction. But also television, other is things like reading, um, and these all reduced whilst obvious uh, other sitting domains didn't have an effect. There was no real effect on physical activity. This, although it looks like a big increase, there wasn't a significant increase in total physical activity, but there was for transport physical activity. Um, so that was quite interesting and it wasn't something that we thought would really affect um, behaviour. but. Uh, an interesting result nonetheless. They also had improved sleep quality um, as a result of restricting their screen time. Okay, so um, I'm not going to run through all of these things, but they're just, with my experience of working with technology and designing interventions and gathering data, what I view as the future for us. And the first thing I want to say is that we need to get ahead of the game. That's very difficult from a science perspective because the time we get to research and gathering data, analysing data, the device that we researched is no longer on the market. So it's a huge issue for us in terms of really understanding the technology. So we need to be able to think ahead, but that means we need to do riskier research and we need funders to support us to do that. Um, people want technology interventions to be absolutely no, no sort of conscious effort involved. They want it to be completely um, automated. They won't have to engage in it at all. They just want it to do its thing. And that's where things like smart environments and discrete technology um, and things like that are going to be very important. 
And the last thing I want to just mention at the bottom here, I should just put up my next little bit. This is kind of on a scale of individual to population level. We need to remember demographics. So we can reach lots of demographics with technology, but not necessarily things like wearable devices. Um, these are not being purchased by people from more or uh, social economic backgrounds. So we need to be quite mindful of that. This is a really nice summary from, it's just published actually yesterday, um, by the PhD Foundation on our healthy future. It summarises really nicely the future of technology in healthcare um, and how it's got to be people centred, it's got to be data driven, it's got to be trusted information, accurate information. Um, so if, you, if you're interested in reading that report, the link is there for you. A take home message for you. I'm out of time, so I've got the red card, I've got, I've got to go. But um, the first thing is that technology can provide us with useful measurement tools and data sources. And that can allow us to better understand the population health. Um, and we need to use that a bit better. We should be using that better. Secondly, technology gives us the ability to engage with traditionally hard to reach people. As I said at the very beginning, we've got 97% of European adults engaged with the internet. So we have reach into communities that we perhaps could not reach before with physical activity. The third thing is digital distraction. Um, so of course we did a study on how people are engrossed in their smartphones, but there is an opportunity here because people are starting to realise how much they're engaged in their smartphones and how much they're being distracted by technology. And there's an a window of opportunity here for us to pin pinpoint them into more healthier behaviours. So just to conclude, we can and we should harness the power of technology to promote and facilitate learning more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Uh, inspiring and informative with some data-driven uh, 